Please note, nothing in this class should be taken as psaq, as halachic guidance. We're discussing halachic issues. Please consult your Rav for practical decisions. Uh, I am grateful to Shari Shemayim for hosting us yet again for a medical ethics uh, lecture. Um, in particular, I am very grateful to Jeff Lipset. Um First of all, for helping um, create the series at Shari Shemayim every, every year, but also really for pushing me over the years to give one of these classes on CPAP machines. Um, I, has it been three years, four years that you've been asking me to do this? And uh, No, that he's been asking me for this topic specifically. <laughs> the, um, no, I think the emails go back about four, but, uh, but they're pretty consistent since then. Um, so um, thank you, Jeff, for, uh, for asking and asking and asking. Um, also, Jeff, I believe, has some props with him for anyone who wants to see an APAP machine. Afterwards, you can, uh, you can take a look there. Um, I'm going to ask for people to please silence their cell phones. Uh, that would be a, uh, a help. Um, and the CME letters for this year's classes should be going out, God willing, um, either end of this week or beginning of next week. Okay. Oh, and the follow-up email from the session will include items that we don't get to for whatever reason, questions that come up tonight, as well as an online evaluation form. The online evaluation form is important for us, specifically in order to be able to be accredited through University of Toronto. So uh, when you get that link, I would ask that you please fill it out. It's a brief evaluation, even if you are not actually a, uh, a, a practicing medical professional, it's still valuable for you to, uh, to fill that out. You just skip the questions about how the session affected your practice. Okay. So, our topic tonight is CPAP, APAP, and BiPAP on Shabbat. I'm going to give a brief scientific background for those who may not be familiar with sleep apnea and the machines that we're talking about. Uh, there are various physicians and medical professionals in the room who can do a far better job than I can, and I hope that they will correct me on any mistakes that I make. Um, two basic kinds of sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea uh, involves a situation in which the muscles um, don't keep the airway open. It may be most severe during REM sleep when neuromuscular output is particularly low. Um, risk factors for this include being male uh, or being overweight, although women and people who are slender can, uh, can have this as well. Um, central sleep apnea is a little more co complicated in terms of the causes as well as in terms of what's done to, uh, to treat it. Seems to involve neurological elements from what I understand. Fortunately, it is also less common. Um, it has its own unique risk factors. It's not really the focus this evening. We're looking more at obstructive sleep apnea. And the risks that are associated with sleep apnea um, go from the mild uh, to the severe. Um, the mild being, as uh, one person, one doctor I consulted commented to me, is, you know, your spouse might kill you. Um, that's on the mild end, uh, if you snore. Um, but uh, then you have problems of sleep deficit and associated risks like hazards while, uh, while driving. Um, and then beyond that, cardiovascular disease, stroke, high blood pressure, arrhythmias, diabetes, through something called the metabolic syndrome. I brought you an excerpt from a paper here in source number two on the sheets. A paper from the Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine. This is just from the abstract. The full article is available online at the link that I gave you. Although obstructive sleep apnea and cardiovascular disease are common risk factors, epidemiologic studies show that sleep apnea increases risks for cardiovascular disease independently of individuals' demographic characteristics or risk markers. Individuals, individuals with severe sleep apnea are at increased risk for coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, and stroke. The underlying mechanisms explaining associations between obstructive sleep apnea and cardiovascular disease are not entirely delineated. Several intermediary mechanisms might be involved, including sustained sympathetic activation, intrathoracic pressure changes, oxidative stress, other abnormalities such as disorders in coagulation factors, endothelial damage, platelet activation, and increased inflammatory mediators might also play a role in the pathogenesis of cardiovascular disease. The point that it's making here, and I'm going to stop reading the multisyllabic words. I've proven now that I can read English. The, um, but the, the, the point that they're making here is 
that there is, or there appears to be a link between certain levels of sleep apnea, they highlight severe sleep apnea in particular, um, and damage to the cardiovascular system and various disorders. Um, And even if it's not entirely clear how one leads to the other, the association has been found in sufficient ways and over a sufficient period of time such that this is considered medical science. That uh, people who have sleep apnea and at certain levels and leave it untreated are indeed risking harm that could ultimately become life-threatening. Now, there's a lot of different data out there in terms of whether a machine will help and to what extent a machine will help. I'm not weighing in on that. I'm leaving that to the medical professionals on that. I've seen data saying that it will help, let's say, men more than women. It will help at certain ages as opposed to other ages. But I, I'd refer you to a medical professional to answer that. But the, what, we're, what we're premising our discussion on this evening is that it is considered standard medical practice to advise use of some of the machines we're going to talk about and on a daily basis in order to treat sleep apnea at different levels and that it may well be something that can prolong a person's lifespan. We're going to be talking about three kinds of assistance. CPAP, APAP, and BiPAP. So CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. And what what that means is the machine draws air from the room and sends it at a relatively high air pressure into a mask that covers the face of the patient. Keeps the upper airway from, uh, from collapsing. The more severe someone's case, the higher the pressure that may be needed. APAP is automatic positive airway pressure, and in this case, the machine detects changes in the breathing of the patient and modulates the air delivery based on that. So it's not just here's your stream of air at whatever setting has been picked, but it's actually going to adjust the flow of air based on the changes in the patient's own breathing. And then you have something called BiPAP. Now, I put on here bilateral positive airway pressure because that was what I read. I understand that there are also, uh, that, that, that uh, a lot of the materials say bilevel positive airway pressure. Um, you can Google it. You can find both. Um, but the point really isn't the acronym. The point is what this machine does. The machine is designed to help people to exhale, meaning it can be hard to exhale when there's this stream of air flowing into you. So what the bilevel machine does, or bilateral machine does, is that it provides one level of pressure for when the wearer is inhaling, and a different level of pressure for when the wearer is exhaling. uh, And it may be used in particular for people who have lung disorders, uh, congestive heart failure, or ALS. There's one other type of machine, as I understand it, called adaptive servo ventilation. I put it on here, ASV, but that's more extreme and, and less common. Pausing here with just the, uh, the medical information. I'm asking in particular for the medical professionals. Is there anything to correct or update in what I said, especially as may pertain to what we're going to talk about this evening? Anything else that people need to know going into our discussion? So, Okay. Okay. And we're going to be talking about some of the nuances of the machines and what they have, because it's not only about the flow of air. So we're going to get into more than that, but that's what, um, that, that's our, our starting point. So take a look, please, at source number four on your sheet. Source number four is a case which uh, tries to present an example of where this, uh, where this issue comes up in halacha, in Jewish law. Leah is a 63-year-old mother of five who has been having sleep difficulties with marked snoring and pauses noted by her husband for the past year. Her BMI is 27. I added it in parentheses there. I, from what I understand, is about 20% overweight. She is hypertensive and has been told she has borderline diabetes. Her father, who also had an elevated BMI and blood pressure, died at the age of 58 in his sleep. After sleep studies, the respirologist suggests she needs to lose weight, better control her blood pressure through medications, diet, and exercise, and that she is eligible to use a CPAP machine during sleep. 
In her repeat sleep study while using CPAP, Leah finds her sleep more restful and decided to follow the specialist's advice. Since the machine she is to be given has to be turned on and off, she asks her rabbi how to deal with this. Her question is, what do I do with Shabbat? What do I do with Yom Tov, with holidays, when turning a device on and off would be problematic? That's the basic question. So, really, this is not one question. This is multiple questions. What questions do we need to address on behalf of Leia the patient? Right. So the first major question we're going to need to address is, what level of illness is this in the system that we use for halacha, meaning we have a system of categories in which we define patients as being mildly ill, very ill, dangerously ill, life-threateningly ill. So where exactly does Leia's condition fall on this spectrum of, uh, of possibilities? That's one question. And then? Yeah. Ah, so Zephyr is a very interesting idea. It won't actually help us in this case, but it's important to know medically, which is we distinguish between taking medication once and taking medication repeatedly. And there are certain leniencies regarding a nuance of the law of taking medication on Shabbos, but it doesn't affect this. That's unique to the issue of taking medicine as opposed to a therapy like this. Yeah? Which will not possibly be violated? Right, which malacha is, is being violated, if any? Meaning, what's wrong with the machine? What are we talking about here? Which is not only a question of, can you turn on and off a, uh, an electrically powered device, but it gets into the nuances of how it is turned on and off, which we have to discuss, but also, again, into some of the other aspects of the machine. For example, the, uh, the machine has a readout many of the machines now, I don't know if it's all of them, has a digital readout that, as you breathe, is going to read what you're doing and read the work the machine is doing. That information is not only going to be displayed on the digital readout, it's also going to be stored inside the machine. For insurance purposes, for medical purposes, that information is going to be stored or it's going to be sent to your phone or to the doctor's phone. Do you have to worry about that? Is that an issue for you at all? Machines have humidifiers. The humidifier is operating on Shabbos. It is vaporizing you know, water in order to send it into the air that's flowing in. For some patients, this is very important for them to be able to, to tolerate the, uh, the device. Is that, does that pose a problem on, uh, on Shabbos? If any of these pose problems, then the next question is, so what do you do? What is the solution? Meaning, are you trying to tell me that there's a problem now and that's it? The machine is out, you have to use it six days a week instead of seven. Or are there ways that all of these issues can be, uh, can be dealt with? So all of those are things we have to deal with. But we start with the question that Dr. Kirshen mentioned, which is, what exactly is the level of illness we're talking about here? So we're going to need a brief review of some of the taxonomies, some of the categories in halacha of illness. We place great emphasis in Jewish law on saving lives. We violate Shabbat in order to do so. We don't even call it violation, meaning that is fulfillment of Shabbat to, uh, to save a life. However, the degree to which we are allowed to override Shabbos in order to save a life depends on the level of need and the level of violation involved. Level of need? Is it danger to life? Is it disfigurement? Is somebody in pain? Are we talking about an adult? Are we talking about a child? And then the issue of the level of the violation of Shabbat involved. Is this a biblical law? Is this a rabbinic law? Um, is it being done by a Jew? Is it being done, being done by someone who isn't Jewish? Is it being done, being done in the normal way? Is it being done, being done in an unusual way? The, uh, all of these are questions that have to be addressed. So the top level of illness in Jewish law is what we call in Hebrew, somebody who is, in fact, dangerously ill. Now, being dangerously ill doesn't only mean that the person can die at any moment and we know they have to get to the hospital and be connected to a machine and whatever else it is that we're talking about, but it's even what we call fake sakana. If somebody is possibly in danger. 
if I don't know? The rule is that we err on the side of caution. And therefore, we treat Safek Pikuach Nefesh, possible saving of a life, as though it were Vadai, as though it were definite saving of a life. And that's something that's really important to keep in mind as we go through this. But even more, what about where a person has a condition which is not life-threatening at the moment, but if left untreated, could lead to a threat to life, to a threat to life long-term. Example, somebody gets a horrible gash. They're not bleeding out. However, there's a risk of infection. Infection right now may mean nothing. Infection 24 hours from now could be a very big deal. So what do we do right now? So if you take a look on your sheet at sources 5 and 6, we get an insight into that. The Shulchan Aruch, written by Rabbi Yosef Cairo in the 16th century, basing himself on earlier rulings, says the following. And as, as we generally do with these classes, I brought you the authentic Hebrew on the sheets so that those who have the Hebrew skills will be able to see the original. But in the interest of time, I'm going to read the English. So Rabbi Caro writes, When we know and recognize that it can wait, that this illness can wait, and desecration is not needed, one may not violate Shabbat for him, even though the wound is internal, and I add it in brackets, and therefore hard to diagnose precisely. Remember, going back to the 16th century. If a wound is internal, they have no idea what's going on. There are no x-rays, there are no MRIs, there are no scans. The, um, you're, you're just going by what you can see externally and trying to, to build on that. So the, the Shulchan Aruch writes that if you know, and when he says no, he means certainty. When you know that there's no danger, you don't need to do anything to violate Shabbat, so don't violate Shabbat. But take a look at source number six, where the Mishnah Guru, Rabbi Yisrael, Mayor Kagan, clarifies and says, meaning that they know clearly that the illness will not get worse by waiting until night after Shabbat. If you know that nothing is going to get worse by waiting, then fine. The, um, but otherwise, you take care of the treatment now, even if the danger isn't actually going to evolve until later. If you know that this will lead to a dangerous situation if not treated on Shabbat, then you do the treatment on Shabbat, even though the, the practical relevance of it isn't until after Shabbat. And so, moving to our own day, Rabbi Dr. Avram Stouffer Abraham, in source number 7, in his Nishmas Avram, writes, the... Um, he says, to do a surgery on Shabbat for somebody who is not in danger right now. He says, you do the surgery now for this patient, even though there is no danger in withholding this because there is danger in his disease, there is some need for this treatment and it will be done on a weekday, then we do it on Shabbat. Let me explain that better because I don't think I introduced it well enough. What he's saying is this. If someone comes into the hospital, he's dealing in a hospital situation. Somebody comes into the hospital and is going to need surgery. And if this were Tuesday, the answer would be operate right away. Then the answer on Shabbat is operate right away. And even if it would be possible to push it off until after Shabbat, if the routine for dealing with this kind of a condition is bring this person to surgery right away, then that's what you will do on Shabbat as well because of concern for this person's health. The, um, so we do basically whatever we would do during the week. And whatever is needed to strengthen his health goes along for the ride. Okay, I'm going to come back to this category in a little bit. Yes, Hashi. Where is that source? Where is his source for doing so? Ramban. His source for saying that is the Ramban. The Ramban wrote a work called Taras HaAdam, or Tarat HaAdam, depending on how you want to pronounce it. The uh, Ramban is from Spain, so I'll say Tarat HaAdam. The, um, and uh, in it, he provides a lot of what becomes medical halacha in the Shulchan Aruch, including this point that you treat the person the way they would have been treated during the week. Okay. I'm going to come back to this category because there's one piece of information that I didn't go into yet. Right now we're just laying out the categories, but when we try to apply it to sleep apnea, there's one more piece of information that we're going to need. But that's the person who is dangerously ill. So if they're dangerously ill, if they might be dangerously ill, if their condition could develop into danger 
if it isn't treated on Shabbos, you treat them now, and you do for them whatever you would do if this were Tuesday instead of Shabbos. Is that clear? We're good? Okay. The second category, below that, is what's called Choles She'ein Bo Sakana. Somebody who is not dangerously ill, but they are still very ill. So if you take a look at source number 8, you find in the Shulchan Aruch a definition. Rabbi Yosef Karo writes the following. For one who is bedridden from illness, but not endangered. The person who can't get out of bed. Okay, so they have a bad fever, and they're confined to bed. They can't, they can't function, they can't get, uh, get up and around. They're not, their life's not in danger. They're going to survive this. But that's their current condition. Or, the Ramah, Rabbi Moshe Israelis, adds what you see there in the brackets. One who is in such pain that his whole body is ill. Even if he can walk, he's like one who is bedridden. A level of pain where their whole body is ill. So what do we do for such a person? So here, the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, goes through a number of different recommendations that were given over time. And we need to find out which one is the one that we follow. So he says, first, we tell a non-Jew to do it. We won't violate biblical laws of Shabbat. Telling a non-Jew is because a non-Jew can do whatever he wants on Saturdays. However, there's a rabbinic prohibition against a Jew telling him to do something. So I'm allowed to, for the purpose of this cholesha in Bosakana, this person who is so ill that he's bedridden, a Jew is allowed to tell him to take care of what's needed. And then as far as having a Jew personally violate a rabbinic prohibition, it depends. Some permit it, even without danger to an aver. The word aver does not have an English translation. You will usually see it translated as the word limb, but it doesn't refer to a limb. Because internal organs are also called avarim. Subparts of organs are called avarim. Some of the bones of the body are called avarim. The word aver is a word unto itself, and it just doesn't have an English word that, tran- that, that works to translate it. Call it body parts, and you're probably as close as anybody can get. And what he's saying is, some permit violating rabbinic law, for somebody, even if there's no danger to the future function of a particular part of the body. Some permit violation of rabbinic law if one of these body parts is endangered, but not otherwise. Some permit direct violation if an aver, a body part, is endangered, and then violation in an altered way if no aver is endangered. Meaning, when it comes to the laws of Shabbat, the, uh, the, the basic principle is that what the Torah prohibits is normal uh, performance of a particular act. So, for example, the, um, to, give a, to give an example of this, one of the laws is, the Torah says, I am not allowed to, uh, to harvest grain on, uh, on Shabbat, not to pick, uh, to pick plants on Shabbat. So, if I um, pick a plant normally out of the ground, I have violated biblical law. If I do it in an unusual way, I don't know what that is, I snag it between my toes and pull it up out of the ground, then, then I violated only rabbinic law. I've done it in an unusual way, in an altered way, that matters. So some say you can violate rabbinic law directly if there's danger to a body part. If there's no danger to a body part, then you can only violate it in an altered way. And I'm stopping there because that's the line I underlined. I underlined that one because that's the view that we follow, which is to say, if somebody's life is not in danger, there's no danger to life. They, um, however, the person is bedridden, I am allowed to violate rabbinic law if I do it in an unusual way. If whatever it is I'm going to do, I don't do the standard way. On that, the Mishnah in source number 9, comments and explains. A Jew may do this in an altered way, but he quotes a book called Chaye Adam, who says that where one cannot do it in an altered way, you can do it normally. Meaning, yes, we'd like you to do it in an altered way, but sometimes you can't. Sometimes it's just not possible. If it's just not possible, then you do it the, uh, the normal way. So what, what we end up recommending here is the following. 
if somebody is very ill, but not dangerously ill. An example I mentioned would be a fever. Another example would be somebody with a migraine headache. Migraine headache qualifies for this category as well. So if someone is in a situation like that, we will violate a rabbinic law for them on Shabbat, ideally violating it in an unusual way, not doing it in the, uh, in the normal, direct way of doing it. So we have the chola shiyesh posakana, the person who's dangerously ill, or possibly dangerously ill, or their illness could lead them to be in danger if it's not treated today. For that person, do what you need to do. The person's not in danger, they're just bedridden and really uncomfortable, really in pain, I should say. Not just uncomfortable, they're in pain. So you can violate rabbinic law in an unusual way, and if need be, even without that unusual way. Then the last category, and then we're going to get back to the sleep apnea discussion, is the person who's not really sick, they're just uncomfortable. What's called mechush. They don't feel well. So in a case like that, there's not a whole lot that we're able to do for them. The, um, there's not a whole lot that we can do. The answer is, tough it out. That's basically the, uh, the answer. I can't violate halacha, I can't violate uh, Jewish law for them. So let's go back now to sleep apnea um, users of such, uh, sorry, users of such machines for sleep apnea. If you have somebody whose immediate survival is at risk, then obviously they are in the first category. They are dangerously ill. Move on. They uh, do not pass go, do not collect $200. We do what we need to do in order to be able to save them, although I'm going to give you a caveat to that shortly. The, um, because there is a caveat that I, have to, that I have to mention. But that's number one. Second, what if you have somebody who may suffer long-term impact on their cardiac health because of their apnea incidence? Then which category do you put them in? That's a lot harder. Right? It is a lot harder. It's a lot harder on the halachic side, and it's a lot harder on the medical side. Meaning, on the halachic side, it's hard because you have to answer a fundamental question, which is, this person may not uh, manifest any signs of anything for 20 years. Or never at all. You don't know. Are you really willing to call them dangerously ill now because they might lose a month or two months of their life 20 years from now? <laughs> and it's difficult medically. Because as far as I understand, and again, doctors, please correct me, the, uh, and nurses, the, um, it's not so easy to say regarding any particular patient. We're not talking about somebody who's in the most severe category. We're talking about a step down from that. To say, oh yes, this person is, gonna, is going to have a shortened life because of the sleep apnea they're experiencing right now. To say that about a particular patient as opposed to a, uh, a group. I'm seeing hands, which is excellent because that's what I wanted. Leia. Uh, not the Leia of the uh, vignette. Different Leia. Okay. Yes. Uh, does it look into morbidity as well as mortality? So almost to suffer a severe stroke. Is that where, where do they? Yes. Where does that that would, so that would fit into this also because the stroke itself is a life-threatening condition. In other words, it isn't only a, a an A leads to B, but it's an A leads to B leads to C as well. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, Julie, and then. What about you? Can use the argument if she doesn't use her machine Friday night and she. Um, then doesn't sleep well, she's exhausted. I mean, then what is her condition going to be like on show this day? So maybe, not just in the long term uh, of her cardiac health risk of stroke, but if she doesn't sleep, she's going to be confined to bed all of Saturday because she's going to be miserable. Does that change her category? Well, I think the, the issue of what she's going to be like the next day may put her in the category, potentially, depending on how bad her condition is, of Chola Shein Bosakana, somebody who's not dangerously ill. But I'm still a step before that. I'm talking about the person who may have uh, long-term impact on their cardiac health. Yes? But if the prescription is made by a physician... Yes. <laughs> Yeah. 
So it wouldn't be done willy-nilly, but, it, it, but that doesn't mean that it's done because of a life-threatening situation. Then why would the prescription be made in the first place? I mean, who do you have to ask? Yes. Well, Sorry? Is it better? Yeah, also, like um, this lady here said, to help with symptoms. So I can't even open their eyes during the day because I'm so tired. Well, I usually it goes together. I'm assuming the, the assumption is going to be made that if a machine like this is prescribed, it's done. So that, I mean, my understanding from people who have them, I'm not talking now medically, but I'm talking about people who saw the flyer and it said, um, class on CPAP machines, and said, that's exactly where I don't want to go because I don't want to find out what I shouldn't be doing. They, um, but they gave me their histories anyway. Um, and, uh, and I've had people tell me the reason they got a CPAP, which was covered by OHIP, was because they were falling asleep during the day not because of concern for their cardiac health. You know, maybe a concern if they're driving a car, which, you know, again, you could talk about it being life-threatening from that perspective. But often it's just a matter of, I'm really tired at the end of the day, and the doctor was willing to prescribe it for that. Albert. I actually want to ask you a question. Why is somebody allowed to take cholesterol so it's going to open up a can of worms that isn't so relevant here, so I'm going to do it briefly. The, um, what Dr. Kirshen, I think, is referring to is the following, and this goes back to what, to what Zev had mentioned before. The, um, there is a rabbinic prohibition against taking medication in a non-life-saving situation on Shabbat, meaning medication for saving a life isn't the discussion. The, what we're talking about is somebody who's in that last category I mentioned before. Somebody who has a mild headache or something like that. Historically, people would prepare medication by grinding something up. You ground up herbs or whatever it was, which is, in fact, a biblical violation of Shabbat for someone to grind something up. And therefore, you had a decree that said, don't take medication on Shabbat for a mild condition because, again... The, um, the, the concern is you're going to come to violate biblical law. However, that rule comes with various loopholes. And one of the loopholes, which Dr. Kirshen mentions, is that in the event that somebody is already taking that medication from beforehand, they are allowed to continue taking it on Shabbat, such as the person who's taking it for cholesterol, some, someone's finishing a dose of antibiotics, that sort of thing. Why? So there are a number of explanations for why this is allowed. Right? Moshe Feinstein wrote, fascinatingly, that it's because of the person's nerves. Meaning, if someone has to take medicine for a condition, and you're going to tell them that they can't take it on Shabbat, they're going to be very anxious all day, and that's harmful to them, and therefore they can take it. Another explanation that is offered is simply because if they're starting taking the medication on Wednesday or on Tuesday, then they have their full supply. You're not concerned about somebody grinding anything up because they already have their medication present. There's a lot more to discuss about this, and I don't want to, because it doesn't relate to, to CPAP use, I don't want to get into that. Because? Side point, which can be discussed. I, you know, we've had this conversation before. But at, at the end of the day, to me, it's the same issue. It's just that the CPAP machine that asked me this question. I'm taking the pill that asked me this. Right, but again, the reason why it doesn't apply here is because, first of all, some of the reasons why the medication is allowed, because it's part of a long-term thing, are unique to the issue of grinding, like, I have the medication with me already, as opposed to Ray Feinstein's argument. But second, because what you're getting around is a rabbinic prohibition and a low-level decree at that, as opposed to either biblical law or rabbinic law dealing with a, a biblical model. This isn't even a biblical model. This is a less you come to grind. So it's of a much lower status, such that we're able to circumvent it in a, on a much easier basis. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't, it doesn't really come into play in, uh, in this. Jeff? And then Rabbi Schwartz. Yes? Is there an issue of how effective the intervention is thought to be in terms of what you get in front of the For example, you have to take a pill, you have to have a surgery, you have to use a CPAP machine, 
we have to believe that this is going to be 99% effective, what if the common wisdom is, it's likely to be 40% effective to help you not have... Right. So the basic principle, Jeff asks the question of the, uh, how certain do you have to be that this is going to have an effect? And the answer is, when this is standard medical prescription, when normal medical practice is to recommend this, that's good enough. And even though normal medical practice may be to recommend something that is only known to be effective in 15% of cases, however, either the cost is low or the disease is dangerous enough that we say, you know what, let's throw everything we have at it. Either, uh, either way. Yes? Why I'll come back this way. Why don't you answer by Kirshen that an assistive device is not medication? Because I'm not sure that's true. What? Well, the medication is only there. They make for it. It's not the important. Can we use a cane and jump? One second. Are you, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understood you. You're talking about in terms of why we don't apply the Xera of, of, of Samaman. Why we don't apply that? He didn't think we do apply the decree. He just wanted to use the same workaround that we use for that decree over here. He wasn't suggesting that, that the decree against use of these medicines applies to the devices. That wasn't you. You know, then I think, you, then I think your answer is correct. It's, a, it's not, it doesn't really. Yeah. Ah, so that's a really good question, and that leads me where I'm going, so I'm even happier. The, um, the question that was asked, of course, the, uh, the question that was asked is, if the physician prescribes two options, one, the CPAP machine, and the other, some oral device that, uh, that I'm assuming now within your question, can also do the job, Right? And isn't a matter of difference of expense or different of, effic- of efficacy or whatever, the, um, then why not just go with the other device? And that's a very important question which we're going to come back to because the, uh, that's, that's where we have to go with this. So hang on to that. I'm just, I, I'm looking at the time and recognizing we have a lot to discuss. So I'm going to move forward here and, uh, and, and um, come back to questions later if there's time. Otherwise, I always follow up by email afterwards. So, we have the top two categories. Somebody whose immediate survival is at risk, and somebody who may suffer, long, suffer long-term impact on their cardiac health. Then you have the person who may be in danger during the day because of poor sleep at night, like the person who is going to be driving a car in the afternoon. And then finally, the person whose snoring is annoying but suffers no apparent other ill effects. As one doctor noted to me, group one is commonly in the ICU, group four tend to be victims of murder. (laughs) um, (laughs) Although I should note from Jeff that there is a thought, not universally accepted to quote him, that even snoring alone may be associated with an increased risk of high blood pressure. Again, I'm leaving that. The issue of diagnosis and studies I leave to the medical professionals. That's not my expertise. The, um, but, but here's the thing. When you're talking about this Category 2 and potential long-term harm to cardiac health, the fundamental question which we've set out but we now need to address is the question of what if it could cause a problem 20 years from now? Not now, not next week, but not using it consistently, day after day after day, including Shabbat and holidays, could lead to some kind of cardiac harm. So take a look on your sheet. It's source number 11. This is a classic source. It's been quoted in various places. I brought you Rabbi Zilberstein's quote of it, but I've seen it elsewhere as well. Rabbi Yitzhak Zev Soloveitchik, the Briska Rav, leading authority in Jewish law in Israel, passed away, I think, in the 70s, told a doctor that saving a life is not specifically the case of someone who is now dangerously ill and will die. Even where the fast, he's talking about Yom Kippur, will affect him years later when the disease will recur. And so fasting now will cause him to die early. This is saving a life and he's required to eat. The case he was dealing with was a fascinating case. It was a case of somebody who was elderly and the person had bouts of depression and the fear that the brisker rub, Rabbi Yitzhak Zev Soloveitchik addressed, was the imbalance caused by fasting could in fact be dangerous in terms of the depression this person was suffering from. And he said, not allowed to, uh, to fast. And the doctor said, he's going to be fine. He'll make it through this. And Rabbi Soloveitchik's response was, it may affect him years down the road, and therefore it's considered a life-threatening condition today. 
the postscript to the story is that the doctor comes back to him and says, yeah, but on the other hand, if you tell him he has to eat because his life is in danger, you're going to do much more damage to his depression and to his mental state. And Rabbi, it's like, uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik at that point said, all right, then that's a different story. This requires that you rehear the case. Then it's not so simple and straightforward. But his point was, long-term risk of harm in the long term is considered life-saving today. I'm just want to, I want to finish this point. So, take a look, please, at source number 12. Rabbi Dr. Avram Sofer Abraham, in his encyclopedic work, Nishmat Avram, on medical halacha, writes about sleep apnea in the following way. Talk about somebody who suffers from sleep apnea. He says, On Shabbat or Yom Tov, he should activate the machine via Shabbat clock, set to activate the machine before the patient goes to sleep, and to halt it in the morning after he rises. If there's a need, he should turn on the machine in an unusual way, such as with the back of his finger, and when he rises, he should leave the machine on until after Shabbat. What I skipped here in my translation, and I apologize because I should have started the quote earlier, is that he writes first, before he says this, that a patient with sleep apnea is is a patient who is considered to be dangerously ill. I'll get back to his recommendations. But he says the patient is considered to be dangerously ill, and he doesn't explain why. And he doesn't give you any sort of gradation of it, if their rating is 12, if their rating is whatever. He didn't say. So I sent him an email to ask him. For those who aren't familiar, who haven't been here before, I quote him a lot, Rabbi Dr. Avram Sofer Abraham was the head of the Department of, of uh, Internal Medicine B at Shari Tzedek in Hospital for decades. And he's also an ordained rabbi. And he also asked all of the questions that came up over those decades to the leading authorities in halacha in Israel. So he wrote this magnificent work of medical halacha in which he goes through, based on the order of the Shulchan Aruch, of the Code of Jewish Law, answering questions that come up related to every aspect of Jewish law. It's not just Shabbat, it's everything. And he's accessible by email. So I, I emailed him to ask him, when you say that it's Chol HaShiyesh Sakana, when you say this person is dangerously ill, the, uh, the person who has sleep apnea, is it on the basis of the argument in source number 11 that his long-term health could be endangered if it isn't treated today? And he confirmed that that was correct and said that was the opinion of Rabbi Shlomo Zaman Orbach. So that's his basis for saying that the person who, who, uh, who could be harmed long-term is considered dangerously ill today. Now, clearly you cannot extend this to all cases. Meaning you can't tell me that everybody with every rating, because it is a, you know, there is a system of rating the severity of the problem, is automatically in this category of dangerously ill. The levels of apnea vary, plus we're talking about skipping it once a week, we're not talking about skipping it every day. The data on the benefits of the machine use varies, as we said before, but what it does tell us is that if the doctor believes that there is a substantive long-term risk to the patient's health, this is considered a Cholashi Yeshba Sakana situation. It is considered a case in which the patient is dangerously ill. That's, that's one key point to know. The other key point to know goes in the other direction. It takes us back to your question about having multiple options. And you can see it in Rabbi Dr. Avram's uh, recommendation number 12 already, which is this. There's a classic debate in Jewish law. When we say that you violate Shabbat for somebody who is dangerously ill, does that mean that Shabbat is what's called hutra, permitted entirely, act as though it's not Shabbos, do whatever you need to do, and don't ask any questions? That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is that Shabbat is dechuya, which means it is pushed off, but it's still there. It's being overridden, but it's still Shabbos. And therefore, if I have two choices for how to take care of somebody, and one of them violates Shabbat, and one of them does not, and they're both accessible in the same way, and using either option will not slow me down, will not endanger the health of the patient, if I know everything is equal, then my requirement is to use the option that won't violate Shabbat. That's what Dichuya means. And that's what we follow as a matter of Jewish law. Shabbat is Dichuya, not Hutra. And so what that means is, if you have multiple options, and again, I have to stress and underline, if all options are equal, 
Not where, by going for the other option, you're going to be slower. Or by going for the other option, you're choosing something that is less effective. Not talking about that. Where all things are equal, then you have the requirement to take the option that is that involves less violation of Shabbat. That's what drives what Rabbi Dr. Abraham wrote in source number 12, when he said, turn on the machine via Shabbos clock. What's the big deal? In other words, you know you're going to sleep on Friday night at fill-in-the-blank time. Right? You're going to sleep at 10 o'clock. So, don't say, when, when 10 o'clock hits, I am dangerously ill, now I need to turn on the machine. Have it on from beforehand. You have it on. Shabbos started, whatever time of year is going gonna, is gonna to vary, obviously. So this time of year, Shabbos starts at 4.30. You know, another time of year, Shabbos starts at 9.30. The, um, whatever is going to be... You're going to, you leave it on from, I'm sorry, uh, let, let, me, let me clarify that because the way the devices work varies. Some devices, some devices require not only power but pushing a start button. Some devices, once the power is flowing, it's going to be on the, um, without having to push a start button. In the event that you don't need to push a start button, so then set a timer and have the timer turn it on at 9 o'clock, 9.30, whatever it is, and it will be on when you need it. I know about the mask and the airflow. We're going to get to that. Just leave it on. Leave it on. Oh, oh, well, in, and in the event that you have to push a, a start button, so your timer isn't going to help you to turn it on, so then the answer is leave it on from before Shabbos. That would be an option for somebody to pursue because there's no reason to break Shabbos for it in the event that you don't need it to. And I did check through Jeff with representatives of at least one of the companies that's very popular with these machines, and I checked into it with others as well, and my understanding from every representative with whom I was in touch is that the machines can run for 24 hours straight if you want uh, without any damage whatsoever. Yes, it will burn electricity. They, um, but every representative with whom I spoke said, you're not going to burn out your motor, you're not going to damage the, uh, the function of the machine. I see one head shaking no. I don't know if you ever spoke to somebody from a company who, uh, who said differently. You know? Yes. You could say so. That's a different story. That, that I'm coming back to. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the question of whether it will damage the machine. If, so that's what I'm saying. It doesn't damage the machine. I'm going to get to the mask and the airflow and the leak. We're coming back to that. Yes? I brought my machine three days for three days up straight. He, he, he runs his machine, you heard it here, on, uh, for a three-day yom tov, he'll run it straight, and he has no problem. You know you're on the record. The, um, Jeff, if anybody does run it and have a problem, you can go back to him. Yes, Jeff. Yeah, we'll get there. We're going to get there. Yes, we will get there. We'll get there, we'll get there, we'll get there, really. The, um, the... It may not be within the time frame, <laughs> the, um, but you'll stick around. The, um, but that's, that's, the, that's the second and very important point. So what we're saying is this. Number one, if the doctor is concerned for long-term cardiac harm, this patient is considered dangerously ill. However, if there are ways in which the patient can mitigate violation of Shabbat, that will be the patient's obligation to do so. I also note, not everybody agrees with Rabbi Dr. Abraham that this, that this is considered chol yesh bo sakana, dangerously ill. Rabbi Moshe Heinemann, in source number 13, he is the chief rabbinical authority for the Star K Kashrut organization in Baltimore. They have uh, stretched way beyond Kashrut and deal with many other issues. So Rabbi Heinemann writes in number 13, although untreated sleep apnea can lead to life-threatening illnesses, it is not obvious that the use of a CPAP machine on Shabbos would be permitted. This is due to the fact that any one particular night of sleep apnea may not be life-threatening depending upon the patient's condition. It may be that only the cumulative effect of many nights of sleep apnea may lead to life-threatening conditions. Therefore, for some patients, I like that very vague, for some patients, 
Forgoing the use of a CPAP machine on only one, on any one Shabbos will not be life-threatening, but forgoing the use of a CPAP machine on every Shabbos of the year will statistically increase the risk of life-threatening ailments. Is one allowed to perform a malacha on Shabbos for a condition which is cumulatively life-threatening? And the answer on the next side... Rav Hainim and Shlita contends that a condition which is cumulatively life-threatening is certainly no less severe than a condition of incapacitating illness, what we call kola she'en bo sakana. He's willing to say it's kola she'en bo sakana, the person who is not dangerously ill. And that's the category he puts the person in. He says, therefore, a person with sleep apnea can certainly do anything on Shabbos which would be allowed for chola kol gufo, which is another term for chola she'en bo sakana. So what we have is the following. Category one, dangerously ill, clear. They're in danger. Again, you do what you need to do, what you must do, but if you can change things, do so. Category two, the person we're concerned about long-term harm to their health, Rabbi Dr. Abraham says they're considered dangerously ill. Rabbi Heinemann is not willing to go that far. He says they're considered to be chola she'en bo sakana. And then, below that, you have the person who is in category three, where getting bad sleep is going to make them very tired in the course of the day. So, assuming they're not driving a car on Shabbat, assuming they're not operating heavy machinery on Shabbat, so they're not entering into danger in that sense, it will depend on how dysfunctional they become when they have a bad night's sleep, if we're not talking about health concerns. Okay. That's in terms of the patient. We still have to get to the machines. Um, I'm worried that if I take questions, we're already 50 minutes in. So I think I'm going to go to the machines, and again, I'll stick around at the end for, for, for questions and comments, but I want to make sure that we apply this. So here are the concerns we outlined. Powering the machine on and keeping it blowing when it's not in use. The digital readouts, which changes with the user's breathing. The internal record of use, which occurs with many models, which again, recorded on a chip, emailed to the doctor, whatever. And then the humidifier, which on certain models will heat the water above a temperature called Yad Soledet Bo. Yad Soledet Bo is very, very important. There is a prohibition against cooking on Shabbos. Heating a liquid, or a salad for that matter, above this temperature, which is called Yad Soledet Bo, is considered cooking it. What is that temperature? Basically 45 degrees Celsius is what you're talking about. 113 Fahrenheit. The, um, there are varying opinions, but that's a, that's a standard one. So what do I do if my humidifier will heat water at that level? So first of all, let's talk the machine. In terms of turning on the machine. So turning on the machine is leaving aside the humidifier for the moment. The, uh, and, it's, and, the, uh, and the cooking issue. But just the electricity involved in turning it on is subject to debate. There is a view that it is a biblical prohibition. There is a view that it is a rabbinic prohibition. The view that says that it's biblical either argues that completing a circuit is itself an act of construction. You are completing a circuit and making something functional. Or, in a more contemporary version of it, it's what's called makebe patish. I brought you in source number 14, Rabbi Asher Weiss's explanation of this. It's a beautiful explanation, but I'm going to say it outside of the text. Even though I worked through and translated the whole thing there for you, I think it's actually going to be clearer if I say it outside of the text. But you can see it there on the page. Rabbi Asher Weiss is a leading authority in Jewish law today, um, living in Israel. Brilliant. Uh, and he came up with the following explanation regarding turning on an electrical device on Shabbat. There is a biblical prohibition, one of the 39 categories of work one is not allowed to perform on Shabbat, called Makebe Patish. Literally, Makebe Patish translates to what? Striking with a hammer. Right? I heard people say hammer. Striking with a hammer. And as it's defined Talmudically, it means when you hit the last hammer blow in building something. Meaning, I'm a carpenter, I put together a table, a bench, a chair, whatever it is, the last hammer blow takes it from not being usable to being usable. That's called Makebe Patish. And what Rabbi Weiss argues, based on a text in the Talmud Yerushalmi, is that any time you take something that was not functional, and you perform an action to it that makes it operate, 
that is Makhevet Patish. You're taking something that didn't function, and you're applying, so to speak, the last hammer blow to make it functional. And therefore he argues that turning something on electrically is indeed, so to speak, bringing the machine to life. You, you're, uh, you're in violation of biblical law. Others have disagreed and said it's a rabbinic prohibition. Either way, obviously, it's an issue. The, only, the, the issue of biblical versus rabbinic is the question of, so when are we justified in breaking it? Meaning, if it's a biblical prohibition, I can only break it as needed to save someone's life. If it's a rabbinic prohibition, then there may be lesser conditions in which I can override it or override it in certain ways. However, there's a simple solution to the problem. And again, this goes back to what I had said before from the Nishma Safram, which is, you start the machine before Shabbat, or if it can go on with a timer, then let it go on with a, with a timer. And then, let's say you're planning on waking up in the morning at 7.30 in the morning. So, set it such that a timer will disconnect it after 7.30 in the morning. That's all. You don't need to leave it running for 24 hours. You know, even if you leave it running at the start of Shabbat because of the start button, you don't need to. Uh, you don't. You don't need to leave it running all day. Just turn it off with the uh, with the with the timer. The um, what happens though in the following circumstance? You thought you were smart. You set it up on a timer, or you turned it on before Shabbos, and then the power went out. Now what do you do? You're stuck. Your machine's off. So now what's your option? So here we go into Jewish law and the issue called Shinui. We talked about this in the diabetes class a couple of years ago. The um, Shinui means an alteration, like we talked about, performing an act which is prohibited from the Torah, but doing it in an unusual way. And the rule is that, as I brought in source number 15, but again I'm saying it outside of the text, the, um, if you change the action so that you do it in a way that people would normally choose not to do it, it is less of a violation. And so what you would do, as you already saw it by Dr. Abraham's advice earlier, is if the electricity cut out, and your machine is off, and you need it, so you take your knuckle, and you push the button that way, because no one normally would choose to do so. The machine's still going to run just fine. It's not going to prevent it from running at all. But just the fact that you do it in an altered way makes it more acceptable. Sorry? Right, only if your power comes back. If your power doesn't come back, then you have to yell at the power company and say, I was dangerously ill. The, um, let's see how far it gets you. The, um, the, but that would be a way to, uh, to deal with the problem for somebody who's in category one, clearly, dangerously ill, and category two, with the long-term harm. But now I come back to the point that was raised about the mask. Standard machines will not blow air if they sense that the mask is not being worn. And therefore, it's only going to start when you put the mask on. How do you deal with that problem? So, I have heard this solution from quite a few people. It's a case of convergent evolution or people just sharing information. The answer is, you wrap the mask in a towel. They, uh, or somebody actually designed a very pretty embroidered Shabbos cover for their, uh, for their mask. If you want to do that, that's even nicer. But what you do is, you, what you want is the mask to retain the feeling of resistance, as though it's on somebody's face. So if you turn it on before Shabbos, and the mask is wrapped in a towel, the mask is going to consi- the machine is going to continue to blow air, and then when you finish with it, and you take off the mask, you rewrap it in the towel so you didn't turn it off by taking the, uh, by taking the mask off. And that seems to be a standard solution for the, uh, for the problem that so many institute in Israel recommends it, so they also are familiar with this idea. The, uh, and that way you solve your problems. It'll stay on. The few moments is not a problem? No, because it's, it's not like it stops you know, on the basis of a leak of a few moments. It's, it's, it takes a period of time. How long, I think, varies by model. But a few seconds isn't going to do it. Yeah? Um, could, you, could you make the argument that a patient would be required to buy a model that does not turn off if it senses a leak? Like older models will just blow 24 hours. Right. So, because the towel solves your halachic problems very easily, I don't see why they would need to buy an older model for that reason. However, some of the other 
concerns may warrant buying a particular model. I'm very careful. I'm not recommending any particular model. I don't want to be in that business. I will show you a link at the very end that's very important to a site where you can learn more about particular models and their halachic issues. But I want to move on to the digital display. If you have the option of eliminating or deactivating the digital display or any LEDs that light up or whatever it is, certainly one should do so. In the same way that if you have the option of uh, an oral device versus a machine, yeah, you go with the oral device instead of the machine. However, if you don't have the option of disabling the display, you are fine. And the reason you're fine is threefold. Number one, when the, when the readout changes as a result of your breathing, you are not starting any new circuits. You are not opening any circuits. All that's happening is you're modulating the flow of electricity. And as Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach wrote, and I brought it for you in source number 16, in context there, he's talking about varying the temperature of an electric cushion heater for somebody who has a very strong stomach problem on Shabbos and they need the heat in order to deal with it. So Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach has quoted there in Shmir Shabbos Kehochasa, a standard work on the laws of Shabbat, that the, uh, there's no prohibition involved in raising or lowering the electrical current as long as you don't start a new circuit and as long as you don't put a stop to a circuit. This is not the same thing as using a dimmer on a light switch. Please don't extrapolate incorrectly from there. You have to know physics. They, uh, they, that's a different story. They, uh, but that's, that's leniency number one. Leniency number two is that breathing into a machine is not the normal way to alter electrical flow. <laughs> Go back to what we said about doing something in the normal way. And I brought you a source on this in source number 17 and number 18. The, um, the, the rule is, based on the, the... Again, this is one of those things where it's better for me to explain it outside than to read the text inside, but I brought you the text itself as well. Rabbi Shmuel Wozner, who was a major authority in Jewish law, and Israel passed away in 2015, makes the argument that... If you perform an action which is normally not associated with the law that you're violating on Shabbat, it happens to be that in this case it is also going to accomplish that end of violating the law of Shabbat, but not with your intent. And you didn't change your action in any way in order to accomplish that result. Then you're fine. His context is motion detectors. I'm walking down the street on Shabbat, and somebody's light goes on. The act of walking is not the normal way of turning on a light. And I am not walking that way in order to turn on the light. I don't care about the light. The light's over by his front door. I can't even see anything where I am from his light. It's his light at his house. The, um, so, because I don't change what I'm doing in order to do that, and the action of walking is not an action we associate with turning on lights, he says, this is not an issue. Yeah, it's great if you could avoid it, but try walking down any street in Toronto at this point at night and, uh, and successfully doing that. That's not, the, uh, that's not the world we live in. So he argues that it's okay, and I'm making the point that the same thing applies to breathing into this mask. Yes, it may alter the display. You're not doing it for that purpose. It's not the way you normally alter electrical currents. There's no reason to view this as, a, uh, as an issue. That's second. Third, and most important, <coughs> the recommendation that I've seen in various places, including the Tzomet organization in Israel, is cover the readout. Now, covering the readout doesn't mean that the readout isn't changing. Right? Like, you know, the two-year-old or the one-year-old, you can't see me type of a thing. That's not what we're saying. However, the reason this is valuable is because it means that you don't care about what's on the readout. We are concerned within Jewish law about times when somebody performs an action which leads to a guaranteed violation of Jewish law and they're going to benefit. So, for example, not my neighbor's motion detector, which turns on a light in his house, but I'm walking in front of the motion detector to get into my house, to turn on the lights so that I can actually see. That's a problem. Even though I'm just walking, not flipping a switch, nonetheless, I am walking that way because I want the light to go on. That's why I'm there. 
That's no good. However, in this case, if I cover the display so that I can't even see it, then I'm fine. So cover your display for Shabbos. That's all, that's all that you would need to do. So for those three reasons, the digital display is not a concern. Are we clear on that? Number one, because, again, the, um, you're not actually starting or stopping any new circuit. Number two, the action of breathing into it isn't for that purpose, and it's just normal breathing. And number three, if you cover it, then, you're, um, then you show this isn't even something that I want or something that I care about. What about the fact that your data is recorded on a chip or being sent to your doctor or to your smartphone? Something that you do benefit from. Because the data is being sent for insurance purposes, because you will need to verify your use of the device in order for it to be covered. The, um, I brought you in source number 20 from the Department of Health and Human Services in the U.S. The, uh, thank you, Jeff, for turning this up for me. I didn't have to go Googling it. But it talks about the need, if you look at the second bullet point, for objective evidence of adherence to use, defined as use of PAP devices for four or more hours per night on 70% of nights during a consecutive 30-day period, dot, dot, dot. You can read the legalese. The, um, but the, they're going to want to know that you used it. And by the way, and this is obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway. If your machine is running for 24 hours, you can't use that towards demonstration that you use the PAP machine a lot. The, um, that doesn't count towards your quota of hours. You have to let them know that it wasn't actually on your face for 24 hours. Let's be clear. The, um, I only really mentioned it because someone asked me that. The, but that's one. It benefits you that way. And number two, it benefits you because the data can be used to calibrate the machine and to see how you're doing health-wise, to determine whether this is good for you, whether it needs to be changed, whether you need a different device. So you can't make the argument that you don't care about it. However, number one, we have Rabbi Shlomo Zaman Orbach's point that I mentioned before about not starting or stopping circuits, as we discussed. That's number one. Number two, if the patient is dangerously ill, you do it. You don't have another choice. If the patient is not dangerously ill, but is in the lower category, in Bo Sakana, not dangerously ill, we still allow violation of rabbinic law, ideally in an unusual way, but otherwise you would allow violation of rabbinic law, which is what you're talking about here, for sure, because again, no circuit is starting or stopping. And then number three, a fascinating argument. Take a look, please, at source number 21. The Hebrew is on one side, the English is on the other. Rabbi Usher Weiss, who was the one who said that using electricity, opening or closing a circuit, activating something is makibapatish, you are making it functional. And so he was strict in that regard, is very lenient in this regard, in terms of where, where you can't see what is going on, as in the chip that's inside the device where it's recording the information. He says the following. The, um, he, said, he, he goes through three different arguments against the use of electricity on Shabbat. One, not use of, I shouldn't say use of, against activating it on Shabbat. One argument we didn't discuss yet, it's called molid, the concern that you are creating something new with the electrical current. So he says, as far as molid, it appears clear the category of molid applies only when one creates something new which the eye sees, the heart desires, people can experience and enjoy. There's a benefit from it, like crushing snow to get liquid to drink, or producing a nice smell with a perfume or something like that. He says, but electrical changes which have no visible meaningful output, where the machine continues to operate as if on its own, do not constitute Molid at all. He says, if you think electricity is a problem of Molid, Molid is only an issue if you can see the result. If this information is being recorded internally in the machine, you don't even know it's there. Number two, he says, if you're going to tell me it's an issue of construction by opening or closing a circuit, he says, with tiny circuits which join and separate in nanoseconds without any practical result or significant visible product, this is not like construction at all. That's not building anything you can see either. And then lastly, he says, with his own approach of Makebepatish, he says, and so too with my approach, that there is in this Makebepatish, because of the significance of the joining, making, making something into something else, 
it appears clear that in all of these cases there is no Makeda Patish. I'm sorry, I should explain. The cases he's addressing are all cases in which your action causes a reaction that cannot be seen. For example, he says, what if you're a, um, you're a prisoner in jail and then they release you so you can be at home, but you have to wear an ankle bracelet, which has a GPS. And every time you walk anywhere, the GPS is now sending signals. So he says, that's, that's one of his examples for what he says is not an issue. And he says here, now go back to what he said, in all of these cases, including the ankle bracelet, there is no Makkah Bepatish. In truth, if we were to come from it as Makkah, if we were to come at it, it should say, sorry, my translation mistake, as Makkah Bepatish, it will be especially clear there is no Malacha at all in the way this happens. As if on its own, without intent, without any particular action, it doesn't endure at all. He says, basically, changes like this, which have no visible impact on the world around you. You can look at the device and never know anything, never see anything, he says, are not considered makibapatish, are not considered a problem. That's his argument regarding this, um, re- regarding this issue. Rabbi Heinemann, in source number 22, agrees. He says, some CPAP machines record information concerning the patient's sleep patterns onto a chip, which can subsequently be brought to a medical professional or by Heiner and Poskins. There is no need for the patient to remove this chip before Shabbos. You are just fine. The last item on this, I'm really just, I, I know there's a lot here. And I'm going to tell you right now one thing that I'm going to have to get back to you on email about it. may be your question. The um, one question that emerges from this is the following. You're telling me that it's just fine to have the information recorded. Jewish doctor, Jewish patient. The information is going to the Jewish doctor, and on Sunday, Monday, whenever it is, the doctor's going to pick it up. Is the doctor allowed to use the information that was sent on Shabbos? Was that your question? It was, that was a great question. <laughs> Right, so again, it would seem to be in the same, same category. Same, same category, same non-problem, same non-issue. The question, though, is, can you use the information? So that, I can see arguments both ways. So I, I emailed the question to Allahic authority I often consult, but I only, I only sent it today. So when I get a response, I expect to email it out to everybody on the email list, and so you'll have that information as well. The... Um, But that's in terms of the chip. So again, keep in mind what we said. Turning it on, do it before Shabbos. Put it on a timer. Let it turn off via timer as well. Make sure the mask is wrapped in a towel, and then you're fine. The readout, cover the readout, you're fine. The the chip, not a consideration. What about the humidifier? I apologize. The the humidifier is my last note before I get to the link in number 24. So I'm going to handle the humidifier briefly. I want to make sure to get to the questions as well. I should know, you're getting credit for an hour and a half, so we're going to use it. The, um, but the, the, um, the issue is this. If it heats the water above the point that we call Yad Soled et Bo, the point where it's considered cooking for Shabbos purposes, over 45 degrees Celsius. So now I have a problem. And to answer Jeff's question from before, I would not be allowed to add water to this on Shabbos, but even if I did it, even if it went on via timer, I would have a problem. I'm not allowed to cook via timer on Shabbos either. The, um, so what I need to do, most simply, Rabbi Heinemann thinks it's possible in source number 23, the, uh, is to simply change it so that the setting is below that point. He doesn't work with 113 Fahrenheit. He works with a different number. Take a look at 23. He talked to the people at Phillips Respironics. And he says, Phillips Respironics has informed me that at the highest setting, the water in the humidifier may reach 125 degrees Fahrenheit. The hot plate, which is heating the water, may reach 158 degrees Fahrenheit. So I don't actually know whether he's working with 113 or not, but these are clearly higher. Water should not be heated to this temperature on Shabbos, as the temperature is above the shiur, the threshold of Yad Soledes Bo. Therefore, the humidifier should be used only on Shabbos at a lower setting, which will keep the water temperature below Yad Soledes Bo, or the humidifier should be turned off for the duration of Shabbos. Now, again, your mileage may vary. Your machine may vary. But this 
low-tech issue of the humidifier is actually the worst problem you have to deal with in the entire machine. Meaning we've stopped turning it on, we've stopped the chip, we've stopped broadcasting the information, we've stopped your digital readouts, and we're getting hung up on a humidifier. The, um, but, but that's the truth of it. That's the, that's the worst of the problems that you have. Again, if you can adjust your settings, you've solved your problem. That's really what it, uh, what it comes down to. If somebody is dangerously ill, then this isn't the conversation. They're going to have to do it. Obviously, we want to mitigate it. We want to change the settings if at all possible. But if that's what they need in order to be able to use it, because of their sensitivity that they require the humidifier beyond, and they don't have the option of changing the setting, then this is what they're going to do. That's going to be the, uh, the requirement. Yeah. Sorry? If the water is in before it's on before it's Then you're just cooking via a timer, which we don't allow. What do you mean? That's what's different than a hot water heater. What do you mean? Let's try it. Yeah. Then your then your water is heated before Shabbos starts. Yeah. Oh, you mean if the water is heated already before Shabbos? Well, so some of the water is there. Uh, no, and if the water is already heated before Shabbos, then I agree. You're fine. It's just like your it's just like your kettle at home. The uh, well, this is also at home. But the um, you know the issue is right. The issue is simply that I would not be allowed to have a uh, an urn set up at home or a kettle set up at home with a timer to make it uh, turn on at 8 o'clock Shabbos morning so that I have hot water when I come home from shul. That is what I am not allowed to do. So that's what you want to avoid here. But no, if it's on before Shabbos and it's already hot, then... Yes, then hot water becoming hot. So, I, so I don't know anything about the capacity it has, how much water it has, and when it would need to be replenished, but that's what will answer your question. I don't, that I, that's, a, that's a question of device. I imagine it will vary by device. I think you meant also the, in the, the urn that it re- reheats, right? The temperature drops in the thermostat. Right. So generally speaking, the um, the urn will be okay. Generally speaking, the urns will be the, the urns once they reach that temperature tend to stay within that uh, you know within that range. The um, the last point that I wanted to make, and then I'll open the floor for all the questions, and we can discuss all the issues that people have patiently been holding. And I apologize again for having to do it this way, but I wanted to make sure to get this out. The um, the last link here is a very important link. Um, You can see there, it is from the Tzomet Institute in Israel, which deals with issues of halacha and technology. They are very, very good. And what they did was, they collected, I think it's about a dozen different devices from different manufacturers. Um, ResMed is there, Respironics is there, Weinman, I think, is another one that's there. They, They collected about a dozen of them. And they wrote up instructions for each one about what the things are that you need to watch for. So if you go to that link, you can get all the information. Downside, it's all in Hebrew. But if you, if you see there the name of the device you have and you want my help translating it, I will be glad to do so. So go to the link. If you see your device there and you want help reading what they're giving you as the guidelines, I will be more than glad to, uh, to do so. I didn't want to start bringing one of them as a model for a particular thing because then, you know, I'm endorsing and that's not where, I, that's not where I'm safe. So, um, so that's why I didn't do that. But that link is a good link. Again, for those who receive this by email, and again, please make sure to sign in. Where are the sign-in sheets? There's one over there. There are more in the back. Um, please make sure that you do sign in. Certainly, if you want CME credit, you have to sign in. Um, but, um, but in any case, if you sign in, then you will be on the email list for follow-up from the session, and you will be able to, uh, to get my follow-up information uh, as well on this and on future classes. The next CME class... I'll mention is Sunday, January 20th, I believe, at the Bayad in Thornhill. It's Sunday morning, and our topic is the total artificial heart and Judaism's definition of death. So that'll be a little bit of a different um, different gear. But I'm going to be, wait, I, I want people to be able to ask their questions. If someone has to leave, feel free to do so. But I'd ask that while everyone is in the room, please um, let other people be able to ask questions and discuss. So, yes. Yeah. Right. Which means that when I put the mask on, it's increasing the pressure, like the filament of the heater helping the gentleman's stomach grow. Yes. And to me, that would, you don't need the 
towel. You know, you need a towel, right. So I was wondering about that also, and why everyone was making such a fuss about the towel, because the same people who are writing about the towel are the ones who endorse the idea regarding the filament. So the answer really is what you need is an engineer to tell you how the machine works. Can I if, my wife? if she's an engineer. The, um, no, in all seriousness, if the answer is that when the machine ramps up the pressure, it's not actually activating any new circuit, then you're correct. I just don't know whether that's true from a practical perspective. You do? Oh, okay, not. Nah. Okay, yeah. My machine, well, it's an auto set 10, if anybody has a resonant auto set 10, it's activated by the air passage of the air. Mm-hmm. How you know is if you have a cold and you put the mask on, and you're breathing through your mouth, nothing happens. Really? You have to go, you have to take the mask off and go blow into it, and then it starts working. And that's one problem. So putting a piece of cloth on it will not do anything. The second thing is what you just mentioned at the last second, the ramp up. Yeah. When we start activating the machine, it's at a lower pressure than the high one when we fall asleep. It's to help us, it doesn't hit you with a whole wave of air, and if I, I think mine, I can adjust it to five or six minutes. And at that time, then it's the full pressure. So if I leave the machine on, I won't be able to use it because you can't fall asleep. So the, um, in terms of the, the problem of being able to fall asleep with it, um, that's an interesting problem. Let me, let me take a step back first, talk about your first problem first, which is I would suggest experimenting with the towel idea just because I've heard it from so many different places. Try it out and see whether it does anything. I think, that's, you know, I, I think it's worth the attempt. The bigger question is the second question, which is what if somebody can't fall asleep when the device is on full force and it's designed such that it builds up and you have the opportunity to be able to fall asleep before it's blowing at full force. That's your question, correct? So in the event that you're in the first category, right, the person who's in danger, or the second category, the person for whom this poses a long-term, a long-term risk, so that we would say that's cholesheyesh bo sakana, there's a dangerous condition, then ostensibly the answer would be that you would turn it on with the back of the knuckle. You know, in other words, you would leave it, you, you know, you leave it powered on, but not on-on. It on. The, um, sorry? It's on the sleep uh, mode. Okay. 24 hours. But to trigger it to, um... Triggering it. Right, so triggering it is not the button, triggering it is the mask. You're saying triggering it is only via the mask. So there's no way to put on the mask in an unusual way. That's my understanding. It, it's got to get on, and it has to sit in a certain way, and that's just the way it's going to be. The, um, so at that point, what you, would be, what you would be able to rely on is, number one, the idea that it's a, dangerously, you know, it's a dangerous condition, and number two, the idea that, according to many, this is rabbinic, and while it would be ideal to do it in an unusual way as well, we say that where well, you can't do it in an unusual way, so you just do it in the way that it's rabbinic, that, that's only rabbinic. And that would be the, the solution. But try the towel thing and just see what, you know, whether it works or not. I think it's, uh, it's worth experimenting with just as, you know, it could be your device is different. It's possible. But try, I mean, try it on a Thursday afternoon. I don't mean try it, you know, as your, your Friday night thing. See what happens. I wonder if it happens to it almost in place and put it in place with the human. Maybe, maybe. It's hard. I, I'm not so clear. Yeah. Is it possible to get a Mariv? Yes, but we're done. Absolutely. Anybody who wants to catch a Mariv, I already did, but anybody who needs Mariv should please do so in the, uh, in the Weinbaum Bay Midrash over there. Um, I, I'm going to ask you to start polling people for it because I'm going to answer questions still because there are a lot of questions still. Yes. One fast in number 11. Yes. Yes. Uh, Right, so the question that was asked was whether number 11, which is the Briska Rubs statement about long-term harm, the, um, the question was, does that connect with the story of Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, who during a cholera epidemic made Kiddush on Yom Kippur in shul and everybody should see that he was eating and that they would eat as well. So I would argue that his case was even more direct as life-saving. 
from my understanding of the impact of cholera on a diverse synagogue population, it isn't even a matter of long-term harm. It's, it's immediate harm. So what he was dealing with was, uh, was even more direct as a life-threatening circumstance. Yes? Where, where do you draw the line between category one and category two? That, that's where I have a problem. You know what? If, if I've been using the machine six days a week for 20 years, then after 19 years and 11 months, am I now category one? As opposed to... Uh, Effect, at some point, you've got the last straw. Yes. And, and that's a gray, very gray. It's a very gray area. Very agreed that it's very gray, and agreed that it's individual, and that's unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, the way a legal system has to work. Meaning it needs the flexibility to be able to deal with diverse cases, and, and right. so you end up with a big one. Category two to category one eventually. Eventually. So then why not just say everybody's category one? Well, the answer is because sometimes you're clearly not. But you don't know. But you don't know. Precisely. No, there is going to be a degree of ambiguity, and it's built into the law. I, I agree with that. Yes, Jeff? If you get over it on the issue of turning the issue of the issue of the issue of the issue of the all the other issues, is there a principle of concern about the auto adjusting machine, which is in fact adjusting the way it operates in response to your breathing patterns? If you need a higher pressure, you need a higher pressure. Right, so I believe not. And the reason I believe not goes back to what I had said about Rabbi Wozner's response regarding walking past the, uh, the motion detector. You're breathing. It's responding. I don't have the option like I do with the digital readout of covering the, uh, the readouts to make it low like It's not low I do care about it. and benefiting from it, and that's why I got that, you know, that machine. I would say, and this is important for, you know, I understand in your, in your practice, that if a patient who is Shabbat observant has a choice between, could really legitimately use a machine that has that kind of feedback response and a machine that does not, I'd rather they get a machine that does not have that kind of response. They can avoid it. If you tell me it's medically necessary, that otherwise they're putting their health at risk, then I'll say, so you get this machine and you use it. But if they can avoid getting that machine, if they can get a machine that's a simpler machine, that would seem to be the sounder policy halakhically. I will reiterate what I should have probably reiterated five times during this year. I do believe I, do believe I said it in the beginning, which is that none of this should be taken as a halakhic ruling. Please speak to your rabbi. The, um, don't, uh, don't take this as, uh, as, as a practical instruction. I said that in the beginning, right? Did I not say it this time? You say it every single time you give one <laughs> Okay. Look at this one the other. Okay. Well, yeah. just, it, it, let's Sorry. say the, the physician says that you can either have a CPAP machine or a device. Usually at that point it's not yet uh, yeshiva enough, but anyway. If, what if the patient can't tolerate the uh, dental if they really can't tolerate it, then it's not an option for them. So they, I don't know what can't tolerate means. They don't like it? Yeah, exactly. So it's almost like, you know, someone's uncomfortable. So, yes. Yeah, so, so the answer is, it, I mean, it depends on what, on what can't tolerate means. Yes, doctor. You've been waiting so patiently. I've known of widows whose husband was examined by a doctor a week before.